Greetings, fellow Rotarians and guests. My name is Joe Young, and it's my honor to serve as the 2020-2021 president of the Rotary Club of Columbus. Founded in 1915 with our first meeting in February of 1916, our club is one of the oldest and largest within Rotary International. Our membership includes a diverse set of leaders within business, city government, military affairs, health care, education, arts and culture, social services, and ministry, all sharing a common desire to improve our community and have a positive impact on the world around us. The world needs Rotary and the ideals that we represent now more than ever. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed the way we live, work, and interact with one another. School-aged children that were already struggling with food insecurity and educational development are falling further behind. Recent acts of violence perpetrated against our African-American brothers and sisters have further highlighted the fact that systemic racism continues to plague our nation. Political division and social unrest continue unabated. The world needs our leadership. And while these are extremely difficult challenges to overcome, Rotary is well positioned to be part of the solution. I long for the day when it will be safe for us to meet and fellowship again in person. Until then, please keep wearing your mask, please keep loving each other, and please keep serving others above yourselves. On behalf of my wife Vicki and our daughters Katie and Lynn, I want to thank you for all that you are doing to make our community a better place to live. It's my pleasure to serve alongside you. Now let's get to work. Greetings Rotarians and guests and welcome to the September 16th meeting of the Rotary Club of Columbus. This week our club mourns the death of Rotarian and past president George Trussell. George was a member of our club for 63 years. Um, he was president in the 70s. Uh, we extend our condolences to his family and friends and we pray that his memory will be for a blessing. Our club for many years has had a tradition of starting meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. In the past, our club also from time to time would sing during meetings. Uh, Rotary clubs around the world today still often uh, sing as, as a part of their meetings. And I recently had a Rotarian reach out to me and ask if we could incorporate that into our meetings. And while I'm not going to make you suffer through my singing today, uh, we are blessed as a club to have numerous talented musicians as part of our membership, uh, one of which is Rick McKnight. Rick was kind enough to make us a, a video with an arrangement of America the Beautiful that we're going to play, and I encourage you to sing along at home. Thank you so much, Rick. That was beautiful. Um, singing and, and music in general has been proven to increase cognitive function and help make people happier. And I hope that each of you will feel a, a greater sense of joy following today's meeting. Uh, our club has had a tradition for, for many years of recognizing an active duty military soldier stationed at Fort Benning uh, for their service and sacrifice. Today, we have an opportunity to honor another one of our own military retirees, and I'm pleased to call on Dick Nurnberg with today's introduction. President Joe and fellow Rotarians, our military guest for today is Master Sergeant Retired Vern Humphrey. Vern was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, he's an Army brat. His dad was a retired retired as a command sergeant major and told him he needed to 
If he's going to join the Army, he needs to go to school and become an officer. But Vern knew better, so he enlisted. And then he found out later on how wise his dad was. He became a medical maintenance technician and had progressed uh, tremendously through the 20 years he served from 1979 to 1999 with several tours at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center in Aurora, Colorado, Eisenhower Medical Center in Augusta, Georgia, the 97th General Hospital in Frankfurt, the 34th General Hospital in Augsburg, Germany, where he was licensed to drive all the vehicles in the motor pool and instruct in driving them, even though he was later found out he was legally blind. So we're lucky to have him here today. He was at the Second General Hospital in Landstuhl, Germany, where he provided uh, uh, support for Operation Hope, uh, humanitarian missions to Moscow, Kazakhstan, Georgia, not our Georgia, but the one in Europe. And he was the acting chief of maintenance there. And then he came to Fort Benning at Martin Army Community Hospital, where he was the uh, NCOIC and acting chief. He had many awards and decorations during his 20 years in the Army, culminating with the Legion of Merit. After the Army, Vern took a little time, then he went back to school. He decided he wanted to learn. And he got his bachelor's in communications from Columbus State, and then he went on to get a master's in communication from Louisiana Lafayette and eventually a Ph.D. in communications uh, from Southern Mississippi. Vern, we're proud of you and we thank you for your service to the military. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick, and thank you so much, Vern. I, I echo Dick's comments and, and gratitude. We're so glad to have you as a member of our club and we thank you for, for your service to our country and your, your service to our community. Over the past uh, well, a couple of weeks and over the next few weeks, we're going to be highlighting different organizations in the community that have benefited from our recent Children's Fund uh, grant disbursements. The organization that we're going to be highlighting today is First Readers of Columbus. Specifically target WIC, Women, Infant, and Children of the Hello, I'm Warren Steele with First Readers of Muskogee County. We would like to thank the Rotary Club of Columbus's Children's Fund for its recent $750 grant for our local mission. First Readers mails books into the home of children birth to five on a monthly basis. We focus on low-income children because they are the ones that are least likely to have suitable reading materials in their home. You can see some of our books that we mail uh, surrounding me today. Currently in Columbus, we have about 3,000 children receiving books on a monthly basis. With this grant, it will allow us to register 20 more children to receive a book a month mailed into their home for one year. We will specifically target WIC, Women, Infant, and Children of the Health Department. We are currently conducting a registration effort with them. In the next 20 children that we register, we will identify and notify the parents that their books are being funded by the Rotary Club of Columbus's Children's Fund. Especially now with many families sheltering at home and library branches closed and some daycares closed, it is so important that our mission allows these books and reading materials to be mailed into the homes. We also provide parent newsletters for the parents to help them engage with their children. These children, by receiving these books, will now have some intellectual stimulation they may not have had before, and they will have early literacy resources so that when they start kindergarten, they will be more likely to succeed in school and compete with their wealthier peers. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Warren. Uh, we're pleased to be able to support First Readers of Columbus. I wanted to remind all of you that uh, contributions to our Children's Fund are made through donations uh, throughout the year from our members. Uh, when you receive a birthday card in the mail from someone in the Children's Fund Committee, we encourage you to make a contribution equivalent to at, at least as, as many dollars as you are years old. You're certainly welcome to, to give more, but as you can see, these, these gifts go to very meaningful causes in our community. We have several announcements today, uh, first of which I want to want you to circle on your calendar Tuesday evening, September the 29th. 
Uh, we are that evening going to be meeting at 5.30, sometime between 5.30 and 7, at the parking garage of the Trade Center. We're going to be doing our district service project to benefit Hope Harbor. This is an organization that supports victims of domestic violence. We're going to be putting together boxes of household goods to be used for families that are served through Hope Harbor. Uh, we are also going to be hosting our district governor. He's going to be joining us for the service project, and it's also going to be a time of fellowship. We're going to have some ice cream available for everybody. If you're lactose intolerant or can't do sugar, we'll try to have some, some other stuff as well. But I encourage you guys to uh, come, bring your camp chairs, uh, plan to hang out at a, at a socially distanced uh, space. Uh, we hope to be able to see all of you there. We're also going to be inviting uh, members from other Rotary Clubs in the community, the North Columbus Club, the Muskogee Rotary Club, as well as our Rotaractors in town. So it should be a wonderful time of fellowship and I hope to see you all there. Our district governor, as I mentioned, is going to be in town that day and on September 30th, he will actually be presenting to our club. We're still going to be doing that in a virtual format but I hope that, that each of you will be able to tune in and, and watch that presentation. Uh, we have a Zoom breakfast mix coming up on Friday morning at 8 a.m. Eric Spears is going to be our speaker for that event. That's a great time of fellowship uh, as, as you're able to interact with, with many of your other Rotarians that, that tune in at the same time. So I hope you guys can join us for that. And also I wanna encourage each of you guys to sign up for Rotary football. We know that this season is a, is a bit unusual due to the ongoing pandemic, but there are a number of teams playing and there will be an email sent out from the office encouraging you to sign up. For those of you that typically have played a team that is not currently playing this year, I know Bates College is one that's been popular in the past. Uh, you are more than welcome to adopt my Georgia Bulldogs or uh, Gene Kemp is, is happy to have you uh, put the Citadel down as, as your school of choice. Uh, whatever school you play, we, we encourage you to participate because all proceeds will go to benefit the Rotary Foundation. Uh, let's see, anything else? I think that does it for our announcements. Um, it's my pleasure now to call on Sonia Overton uh, to introduce today's program. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce Amber Clark, CM, who was appointed as the airport director for the Columbus Airport in 2018 and serves as the chief executive officer responsible for the overall management and administration for the airport, as well as administering policies and directives of the commission. Amber holds a bachelor's of science degree in aviation management and received her certified member designation from the American Association of Airport Executives in 2017. She is also the current acting vice president of the American Business Women's Association, Harris County Charter Chapter. Amber holds a commercial pilot certificate along with her instrument and multi-engine rating with currently a little over 350 hours of flight time. Through an internship with Delta Airlines, Amber also assisted in the merger of Northwest and Delta in 2008. Please welcome Airport Director Amber Clark. Thank you, Sonia. Um, you know, it's uh, just a pleasure to be able to come and speak to you all today. Uh, it is part of the Columbus Airport's mission to meet the air transportation and economic needs of our community, its partners and customers. So any opportunity that we get to speak on these topics is, is just a blessing for us. Um, so I'll go through uh, what we're going to speak today. And so we're going to give you a little brief history. Um, and give you an overview of our assets here on the airport if you're not familiar. Talk a little bit about COVID and how it's affected our operations. And most importantly, uh, speak to air service development and what it means for our community. So history, our airport was built in this location back in uh, 1944. The purpose of that was to help improve the mail system as well as bring commercial service to our city. We did have our first jet service back in 1958. And the airport was owned and operated by the city of Columbus until 1968 when a, a commission was made to actually run the airport. We are a self-sustaining entity, so we are not subsidized by the city's budget. 
Uh, our current terminal that sits here today was designed back in 1989. Uh, it may look like that for some of you who have visited. It was actually completed um, in 1991, hence why we are doing our terminal renovation project. The commission did purchase the FBO or fixed base operator on the field. Um, that is a, they provide fueling and concierge services to our general aviation sector. We did celebrate 75 years last year, so we are 76 years strong and super proud of that. So an overview of what we have on our airport, we actually have 680 acres that we have to maintain for safe operation of our aircraft. We have 26 hangars that have multiple bays within them, so we can actually base over 120 aircraft here, and all hangars are currently full and have a waiting list. Uh, we do have two terminals that we maintain, so a general aviation and our commercial service terminal. We do have two runways. Our main runway is 7,000 feet long, which is typically used for our commercial airline flights, as well as multiple corporate or you know, even small aircraft can use it. We do have a secondary runway, which is 4,000 feet long, mostly used for if the winds are kind of in a different direction and our smaller traffic would like to use that runway, it's available for them. We do have over 35,000 takeoff and landings every year. Um, obviously, with COVID happening right now, we anticipate that's probably going to go down a little bit. We do currently have one airline that's operating out of the airport. It is Delta Airlines, and it does provide service um, from Columbus to anywhere, anywhere in the world. You just have to pass through Atlanta. Um, so we do have 50,000 employments every year, and again, we anticipate that will be affected by COVID. We have six rental car agencies that are located within our terminal, and based on Georgia's Department of Transportation's economic impact study that was done, we actually uh, impact our local community's economy by $70 million, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So COVID, obviously, it's, it's very relevant uh, today. We're feeling it just like everybody else. However, we are practicing uh, the typical safety standards that you would see. So we do have um, social distancing decals on the floor to make sure that people are standing six feet apart when they're in the rental car lines, um, checking in for their flight, processing through the TSA checkpoint, as well as seating. We have the decals um, blocking off certain seats. We do have sanitation stations throughout the terminal, so hand sanitizer is readily available for anybody who would need some. Of course, all of our staff and our partners are wearing appropriate PPE. With the mayor's executive order, we're also ensuring that any passenger who's entering the building is also wearing um, a mask, so we're all wearing masks. Uh, we are continuously sanitizing our facilities. You can actually see uh, one of our employees here has an atomizer. We do actually spray down soft surfaces that would typically be hard to sanitize at least twice a day. Um, all of our airport partners like Delta, TSA, our rental car agencies have really stepped up their game. Um, our rental car agencies have really elevated the standards of their cleaning of the vehicles that they give out. They are, of course, wearing PPE and have san hand sanitizer for everyone. Uh, Delta Airlines, it is requirement for you to wear a mask when you're on the aircraft, so they're providing those for you if you don't have them, uh, as well as when you get on the aircraft, they are separating the seating. So you've heard leaving middle seats open. If you've traveled with us before, we have smaller air aircraft, so we don't have a middle seat. However, Delta is um, eliminating somebody from sitting next to you. If there's an issue with that, they will come to you and, and make other arrangements. So they're doing a great job on that. They're also using an atomizer on the aircraft as well as their gate area. And of course, TSA is wiping down all the bins and making sure that they're, they're participating as well. So we've got some really great partners to make sure that our, our terminal and your air travel is going to be safe when you fly with us. So we've had some progress through, through this uh, COVID. We've actually started our terminal renovation project, which I mentioned earlier, and we started that back in, in April, so right after it hit. And some of the reasons why uh, we were able to do that is obviously the grant funding that we received from the FAA, um, Department of Transportation, and the Georgia Department of Transportation. Um, but it was really important for us. You know, at that time, a lot of people were looking at possibly being laid off, losing their jobs. We had a lot of local contractors um, that had bid on this project. And so it was very important for us to continue and make sure that those people in our community still had a project to come and work on. 
uh, of course, you know, the whole process of the terminal renovation is, is for our community. It's to provide a better CSG for you when you travel and to attract other airlines to our community as well. Of course, we've had our setbacks. Um, we've actually seen a 91% reduction in passengers. Uh, we do have um, four flights still going today. However, um, when it first happened, we dropped down to one. So we, I'm sorry, we have three flights today anticipating four. Um, but we, we've gotten you know, our, our flights back up, which is great. Of course, we're only filling the aircraft about 50% to make sure that our passengers are safe. So that's where that reduction in passengers are, is really coming from. Uh, we've had to implement some limited staffing and flexible shifts uh, to make sure that our employees are safe as well. Um, but our, our revenues have decreased by 30%. Um, we are lucky that we are kind of diverse, that we also receive revenues from our, our FBO, as well as our rental cars, our parking lot, so some other factors. So even though we've had a 91% reduction in passengers, we're, we're still maintaining a, a good amount of revenue. Um, and of course, we received uh, $1.2 million in the CARES Act, which has been really helpful for us. So we're going to put that, um, that money towards our payroll, our utilities, to ensure um, that we're, we're able to maintain those even during this time of reduction. And of course, we want to make sure that our community knows that um, when you decide that it's okay to travel or your businesses start traveling again, um, that you understand everything that we're doing, our partners are doing, to make sure that your travel is going to be safe and um, we welcome you back when that time is right for you all. So I'd like to transition into something that's very important, which is air service development. So the airlines have kind of transitioned over the years. Um, we've had a lot of mergers, a lot of airlines go out of business. So back in 78, we actually had 18 major airlines, or sometimes called legacy carriers. Now, if you look today, we only have four. So we've got Delta, United, Southwest is now being considered a major carrier, and American Airlines. Similarly, we had 51 low-cost carrier airlines back in 1978, which now we only have six. So you can see Southwest is still listed on there. However, they're more transitioning into a mainline carrier. So we've got JetBlue, Spirit, Alaska, Frontier, Allegiant, Sun Country. So you can see we typically about have 10 airlines that we are soliciting to to bring service into our airport. So what is air service development? Air service development is building and maintaining air service capacity at our airport. So basically, building is bringing in new nonstop routes or adding additional frequencies to the routes that we already have, or even upgaging the size of an aircraft. So we currently have CRJ 200s. If we got a CRJ 900, that would be considered the building portion of air service development. Maintaining is more understanding our competition. What other airports are, are we competing against? And expelling and reducing leakage. So preventing or reducing people who are in our market, our area, and traveling to other airports to actually get on an airplane and fly. And then, of course, marketing and sustaining our current routes in air service. So who is it that actually benefits from air service? Well, honestly, it's our whole community. It's not just our airport. It's not just the people who fly. It's not just the airlines. It's, it's our community. So having additional air service here is going to help stimulate our economy. It obviously helps create additional jobs here at the airport, and it creates better connectivity for our customers and businesses who are looking to come to Columbus. And adding additional service is really important because it actually creates competition, and it's kind of like a cycle where it will bring more service. So we're, we're really looking at building that because it's something that's truly uh, beneficial to our entire community. Again, it helps support tourism, you know, um, bringing other businesses here. So it's, it's super important to us. So I spoke a little bit about the Georgia Department of Transportation's economic uh, study. So here's a little more detail. During the study, they determined that uh, the airport itself indirectly and directly had a total of 622 jobs. Uh, the total payroll was about $25 uh, million. And our total economic impact was 70.1 million. So that's measuring the value of our goods and services that are related to the airport. 
So let's talk about some challenges when it comes to air service development. So some people ask me, you know, why can't you just get a flight, you know, to, um, you know, Kalamazoo, right? And you have to understand that airlines have certain restrictions or guidelines that they follow for their business model. So a lot of airlines are hub focused. They don't want to fly over their hubs. It's not profitable for them to do that. Some direct routes are not profitable for them because they don't have a market share there. Um, they like to feed their hubs. And they may also not be aware of our community and what our community has to offer. And the most important one is limited resources. If you think about it, airlines only have so many aircraft and they have to maintain them for the life of that aircraft. If they decide to add new aircraft into their mix, they put an order in with a, you know, a producer like Boeing or Airbus, and it takes a while for those to be produced and then released to an airline. And typically, even when they do that, they're replacing some of their aging aircraft. So they have a limited amount of aircraft available to put onto routes. They're going to put those aircrafts on the routes that are most profitable to them because it costs a lot of money to operate a flight. You have to think their number one cost is actually fuel. So the amount of money that they have to pay for fuel, for the maintenance of the aircraft themselves, the salaries of all their employees, all these costs add up. And it takes a lot to operate even a 15 minute flight from Columbus to Atlanta. Um, so they have to pick the routes very wisely. And so they will look at where their hubs are, what their business model is, and they will only pick routes that will fit those business models and then also be most advantageous to them profit-wise. So another challenge is airline decision makers change often. So typically when we're talking to, um, you know, a network planner, by the time, you know, the next time we get to meet with somebody, they may be, you know, moving up in the company or they may have moved to another company. So we're constantly having to rebuild those relationships when talking to um, airline representatives. So new service um, may actually have impact on some of their current service. So they have to be very considerate when they put new routes in there because they can actually cause what's called cannibalization and actually take away um, some capacity and some flight, some uh, profit from other routes that are either close or similar. So that's also something that they take into consideration. And then capacity drives uh, pricing. You know, the more seats that they, they introduce, the cheaper prices that they have to reduce to, it actually provides a lower yield for the airline. So they're very cautious about adding new routes. And discovering what airlines will work best for your market. Again, they all have certain business models. It's determining what your locations you're looking to add to your community and which airline fits that for you. So what are our current successes here at CSG? Well, in our building section, we actually have a small community air service development grant through the Department of Transportation. And basically, that provides a $750,000 revenue guarantee for a new airline coming in to bring service to our community. And basically what that does is when an airline comes in, it's gonna be difficult for them, right? We have competition here, um, it's gonna be new, a lot of people aren't gonna be aware of it. And so we have to really market that. That first year may be difficult for an airline to produce a lot of revenue. So this guarantee is helpful because if for some reason they're not at least breaking even, this funding can be used to help them not lose revenue while they're starting up in that first year. Um, so pre-COVID, we actually had an announcement that the, we were going to get a fifth flight. So um, we were super excited about that. Of course, COVID happened. Now um, we were down to one, but we've increased to three. So to me, that's still progress. We'll, we're still moving in the right direction. For the maintaining side, um, you know, I'm pretty proud. I'm going to brag on Sonia here but we actually found that we increased our passenger uh, count by 8% last year. And I'm gonna say that's completely due to our marketing endeavors that we had here. Um, and we've actually been able to maintain 30% uh, load factors uh, here after COVID. Um, so we've been doing a great job. Um, those are some of our successes we like to brag about. So let's talk about the air service development process, right? How does it all work? So the very first step is that we are going to do a market assessment, and that's kind of what we're doing now. 
So we're determining, we're looking at our community, determining where does our community need to travel? What are the locations that they need to fly to? Whether it's their, they have a headquarters somewhere, they have a uh, supplier somewhere, they have a sister company, um, they just have a big customer base somewhere. Our military has specific places that they travel. Um, where is our tourism coming from? All those factors we have to consider. And then, based on that information, we have to determine which airline fits that, right? Again, they have certain business models, so which one's going to work for those destinations that our community needs? So, after we've determined the air carrier, we start building a case. And we do have an airline consultant uh, that we work with, and he comes and visited, visits our community and, and meets with our stakeholders as well. And together we build what's called the business case that describes, you know, the locations that we're looking to go to, uh, the travel statistics of who's flying, how many are flying, how much, you know, money would be uh, an opportunity for an airline, and basically trying to make it as um, profitable for the airline to hope that they will select that route. So airline approach options. So how do we meet these airlines? Well. There's a couple of conferences that we go to every year, and basically they have all the airlines there, and a lot of airports come, and it's like speed dating. You basically sit down for about you know 10 minutes, and you have 10 minutes to pitch your community in the route, and why is why is this the best the best route? You know, and why are we the best community, and why should they pick us over you know the guy sitting right next to us? So um, basically, that's the First, you know, you're just trying to get them interested. You're just trying to get some kind of piece of information that will capture their interest, and then you can come back and meet with them later to discuss it uh, in a fuller depth. So once we do that, we continue to build those relationships, like we talked about. You know, we're we're emailing them when new things happen. Uh, you know, we talk about our filming industry. We talk about um, you know big successes with Fort Benning. Anything that we feel will keep us relevant in their mind and help them maybe pull that trigger to finally come to our community. If we do a good job of that, then we'll get what's called a headquarters proposal. We'll get invited out to their headquarters and that's where we sit down and have an in-depth conversation with the airline and really go over the statistics and show uh, how our route is the most profitable for them. They will do what's called a forecast and they'll determine based on their cost is it really profitable for them? Uh, so then we'll go into our value proposition. So basically, what can we offer them that would reduce costs? Can we provide um, free ground service by using our own staff? Can we reduce their landing fees? Whatever we can produce to uh, an incentive program, we will um, provide them as well. If they like that, we'll get into negotiation stage. After that, we secure the agreement. Finally, we'll start planning the launch of our service, and then we have to sustain that route, right? Like we talked about, it's, it's kind of hard in the, the first year, and so making sure we're sustaining that and showing it's going to be productive for the airline or else they will not stay within our, our market. This whole cycle can take one to three years. So you can see how difficult mm -hmm. it is to actually secure a new route with an airline. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So market assessment, that's what we talked about as far as what we are currently doing. Um, our catchment area, that's what we look at, is a 30-mile radius, and we look at how many passengers are traveling. And we get this data from the Department of the Georgia Department of Transportation. They actually report this information, and they get it from the airlines. So we looked at the 30-mile radius around uh, Columbus, our airport, and we have 264,000 passengers that travel each year. Unfortunately, out of CSG, we're only retaining about 4% of those passengers. So we're seeing a 96% leakage to Atlanta. Um, so that's, again, one of our things that we're, we're trying to work on. We've identified our top markets. So we know that our, our community is traveling to Los Angeles, uh, I'm sorry, uh, New York, Orlando, Chicago, Boston, Fort Lauderdale, Newark, uh, Fort Worth, Los Angeles. Baltimore, Denver, Philadelphia, Tampa, um, Detroit, and Miami. So if, if any of those sound familiar to you or you're traveling to those areas, we've identified those as some significant markets of travel for our community. 
So now we're trying to identify the why. That's the most important. We can go to an airline and we can say, well, we know we're flying to these destinations, but if we can't tell them why, then you know they're not gonna take that risk on our route. They wanna know that that type of travel is guaranteed. It's something that's gonna be there consistently. So that's what we're doing right now is we're reaching out to our, our community members, our, our corporations, our military partners, um, even our, our economic development um, chamber and even our tourism partners and trying to get this information. Uh, we want to know, you know, where are the movement of soldiers? Um, is it base connections that, that are causing these routes? Um, is it corporate travel? Like we talked about these types of items, the, the parent sister companies. Tourism, are we seeing you know, certain areas that are higher than others as far as visitors coming? Um, so we're gathering that information now. Air service development is not just an airport function. It is truly a community initiative. Just as the community is supported by air service development and benefits, we all have to work together. So we are currently going and visiting, um, well, probably not visiting at this point, right? We're all still using virtual, but we'd like to either meet virtually or get information from our corporations. Um, and some of the information that we're looking for is number of employees that travel every year. What are some of the main destinations and why? Um, please, we'd like to hear feedback about your experiences. You know, we've heard people say 10 years ago they flew and they had connectivity problems. Those are things we'd like to know because we would like to explain, um, you know, hey, we've got four flights or we can show you, you know, what our connectivity um, rate is. So we can kind of help combat some of those past experiences that may not be happening anymore. Um, we are constantly looking for support letters from, you know, our communities, our corporations. Those are things we can bring to our airlines during those meetings and say, hey, we've got a major corporation here that employs, you know, thousands of people and they are consistently flying to, you know, Denver and they can provide a, a guarantee of 30% of, of their travel, you know, using your airline. Or, you know, we typically use your, your point reward system and we would transfer from Delta to your service, you know, American, and we would provide a support letter saying that. We're asking um, for, you know, reports from, we're reaching out to our chamber, we are working with them and our economic development partners and just getting reports. Um, another thing that airlines look at is our uh, demographic information, right? So how many people do we have in our, our city? What's our population? What's our GDP? Um, are we showing a growth in, in, in jobs uh, and employment rates? Are we showing growth in um, you know, our, our economic status? So those things are really important because they want to see cities that are growing. Uh, we also need to provide tourism trends and military needs and, and all those partners are working great with us. Um, we ask that our community, you know, check CSG first, right? We hear often, well, it was $200 more to fly out of CSG than it was maybe Atlanta. But, you know, if you think about it, um, CSG, we, our parking is right out front. Um, you can show up probably 30 minutes before your flight, go through TSA in a couple minutes and you'll be on your plane up to Atlanta um, in no time. You don't have to go through the security screening that you would in Atlanta. Um, you know, it, it, is that $200 driving and parking, is that $200 worth all those extra things that you have to go through? Or is the convenience here using your hometown airport worth that? You know, um, if you think about it, we always talk about um, shop, you know, buy local, right? Well, we also talk about fly local. When you fly out of Atlanta, you're not supporting your local community. Those, that economic impact is going to Atlanta. It's not going to Columbus and all the people here that have jobs related to the airport. Um, so, you know, we have these conversations because we want to make sure that we're educating our community on that. And we ask that you be an advocate. You know, please pass this information along. Um, you know, let people know what we have to offer. Uh, it's just really important that we get our community to understand some of these items. So it's our mission like I said earlier, to meet in the air transportation and economic development needs of our community. So these are things we're working on. We're working on the air transportation portion of it. We want to provide a first rate terminal and provide more air service so that they can bet, our customers can better connect to where they need to go. Uh, economic development, right? We, we're a partner in that. We want to make sure that we can provide good connectivity to attract more businesses here. Is there a possibility to produce a cargo or a logistics here on the airport? we're gonna be looking into that. 
And it's our vision, you know, to set the standard as the hometown airport known to provide airport services and amenities with a personal touch. And that's what's important to us. That's what sets us apart from an Atlanta Hartsfield. We don't compare ourselves to that because we want to make sure that we're providing that personal Columbus touch to our community. So that's really all I have for you today. Um, I'll welcome any questions and I've got some information up here if you want to contact me directly. Um, I think they're going to help send out a survey that we've sent out through the chamber. Um, we're going to send out a survey link and if you'd like to help answer some of those questions or if you don't directly relate uh, with the travel plans, if you could please pass it along to somebody in your corporation who does, we'd love to get your information so that we can kind of take the next steps on our air service development. So thank you again for the opportunity. All right, hey Amber, it's uh, Cameron. I, um, we have a lot of questions today. Okay. And it's 12.56, so I wanna ask Rotarians if you can stay on a few minutes longer because I'd like to get through several of these. And for those of you who posted questions, <laughs> some are similar, I'm gonna try to consolidate them. <laughs> uh, but the first is really just timely. How has uh, Hurricane Sally or other hurricanes in particular uh, affected Columbus Airport? Uh, travel? Of course. So we're actually preparing um, for that now. Obviously, we're batting down the hatches, closing all the hangars and things like that. As far as our flights go, I just had a, a conversation with our Delta station manager. Um, they are preparing to continue to fly throughout the day. The only concern that they had is possibly their last flight, which comes in, um, drops off all the passengers, remains overnight, and then goes out the next morning that flight may be affected, um, but they're gonna get back to me probably after this meeting to let me know. So we're watching that for sure. Wonderful. Um, I, I wanna ask this question because I think it's important that it's, it's repeated. You, you really answered this question in the course of your program, but the, the, there is recognition here that the airport contributes significantly to the economic vitality and the economic life of Columbus. And the question was, what can citizens do to keep it viable? Uh, so what, what is, what's your answer for that? Basically, fly. Fly out of the airport. That's the biggest thing. Um, you know, we have a lot of other airports that have just as many people in their community. You know, we're the third largest city in Georgia, and it's, it's a, a treat to have a, a local airport that's here committed to your community. So we ask that, you know, again, look at, look at the ticket. If, if it's a, possible for you to fly out of the Columbus Airport, we would definitely recommend it because again, that's, those, are, those are the funds that are gonna go back and support our community and keep us going, keep us, keep us being able to continue to develop and grow with those additional revenues. Right, well, and I've crunched the numbers before personally, as, as you had described, when you factor in the, you know, the gas to and from Atlanta and the time spent in the car and the parking, depending on the length of, of your trip, if you're gonna be away and, and you're parking somewhere, it's a daily rate. Um, oftentimes it, it's, it's almost to break even and you get the time and uh, not, not as much risk on the drive to and from, maybe not as much risk of getting a speeding ticket even. <laughs> so <laughs> you can exactly. it that way. Uh, but it often, it often does, if you factor it in, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's minimal, the, the difference. And whatever the difference is, if it's over, you could view it as an investment in Columbus. Um, Absolutely. Question. Um, what is the cost to operate a flight from Columbus to Atlanta? Oh, I wish I had that for you. I'll have to get back. Um, I had a slide that I almost put in there that wasn't for Columbus specifically, but it did break down on a traditional flight. Um, I wouldn't want to ballpark it for you, but I can tell you it's a lot more than you think. You know, um, fuel alone um, can can be very, very expensive. And you think how many gallons they have to take and, and what the price of uh, jet fuel is today. Um, I can probably get you back some information, but it, it's, it's pretty costly. Um, but as far as our market, probably not as costly as many others. Like I said, it's just a 15 minute flight. So the amount of fuel that they burn is, is not typically um, as much as another route. I understand. Uh, so here's a question I'm gonna consolidate. How has COVID impacted military personnel flying in and out of the Columbus Airport, and also how have travel restrictions at Fort Benning in general impacted the yes. That's a great question. Um, so obviously with Fort Benning kind of putting the travel restriction, um, what we've been told is that if it's 
over 150,000 miles that they're trying to travel, they're actually not using uh, airlines. They're using private charters or, um, I think, busing to certain areas and then taking more direct flights. But they are actually traveling 150 miles or less via, you know, our airport. So um, it's, it's definitely impacted us. Military is our biggest percentage of travelers. Um, but we know that's going to, you know, eventually go away. And us being a military uh, town is really good for us. And actually, right now, it's provide a really good benefit because to airlines, that's, that's guaranteed travel, right? It's going to come back. It's going to be there. And there's even maybe a, a, some pent-up demand. So right now, we're actually talking to an airline specifically about that. And uh, hopefully here in the next couple months, we'll move to that. Uh, we actually have a headquarters meeting. So we're, we're hoping that we continue in that process that we talked about. But we're very fortunate to have Fort Benning. And we have been working very closely with them. So. Great. Well, we hope that, that covers uh, for the benefit of the airport. Uh, here's, a, here's another interesting question. If Portland, Dallas, Fort Worth, Philadelphia, and Miami are top places and are American airline hubs, do we have a goal to bring American Airlines or its regional services to Columbus? We do, and we have been actively talking to American. Um, you know, airlines have faced a lot of uh, hardships through COVID, right? So we've we've been on their radar for a long time. You know, they're interested in bringing several markets, an east and a west market here, because they need to do that to be able to compete with with Delta. Um, and so it is it is something that's on our radar. We're working with them on, but again. Um, you know, you hear a lot of these airlines that are laying off air uh, pilots. You know, they're having difficulties um, moving aircraft to certain destinations. They're actually eliminating some of their routes at this point. So I think they're still trying to figure out kind of how they're going to recover. And those types of airlines, the larger ones, are actually not looking to add new routes. They're more focusing on recovery. So it may be a year or two before we actually see them add those new routes, unfortunately. Well, hopefully, if we that will uh, enable you to achieve that goal of bringing American Airlines. I think, again, uh, the, the airport's ability would likely be how much use our, exactly. uh, we, our citizens are making of our airport. So that's another thing you can do, Rotarians, is fly, fly, fly out of Columbus. Final question. Middle Georgia Airport has Contour that flies directly to the D.C. area. Are smaller airlines with similar direct flights to smaller airports uh, considered? Yep, so it is. Um, that particular flight is very unique. So that is actually funded by an um, essential air service grant. So actually the Department of Transportation is providing funding to sustain that flight. Um, that we are not eligible for that based on um, how many employments we currently have. So um, Macon is, is, is lucky to have that, and that's kind of how they've been able to secure that. But there are other opportunities for smaller airlines, something maybe like an Allegiant, right? We had some Florida markets in there. That's a, a big hub for Allegiant. We even have, um, which wasn't listed up there, but we do have some travel to Las Vegas, which is another Allegiant um, market. So we are looking at different things that are, are, are like that, some of the smaller carriers. But again, they still have their, their certain business plans. Um, Allegiant, we have spoken to them, and they would be interested. But their comment was, we're not going to add a flight unless it's longer than an eight-hour drive. So again, they all have their specific things that they look at. So for us, maybe only a Fort Lauderdale or Miami would work for them, not a, an Orlando or, or something like that. So it's constantly having those conversations and just finding which airline is going to fit what we need. Wonderful. Well, Amber, thank you. This has been so informative, and uh, we appreciate your service to Columbus and your service to the Rotary Club. And President Joe, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Amber, we really appreciate your uh, program uh, for us today. Uh, we, we thank you for all that you're doing out there at the airport, and Sonia as well. I appreciate both of you guys, and we're so glad to have you in our club and, and, and have you share with us today. As you know, our club has a tradition of donating a children's book to the uh, Columbus Public Library in honor of our speaker, and we're happy to, to do that for you. Um, what my takeaway from the program, I mean, you had lots of great points, but I remember you said shop local and fly local. So hopefully right. we'll, we'll all do that uh, for you and, and, and the quality of our airport will, will continue to, 
just in, in, increase over time. But certainly we, we appreciate you and everything that you do. Um, Thank you. I want to remind everybody that a replay of today's program will be available on uh, Facebook immediately after um, the, the broadcast and a link for YouTube will, will go out later on. Uh, breakfast mix Friday morning, 8 a.m. Eric Spears is the speaker, so appreciate Eric doing that and hope to see you guys there. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys next week where our speakers will be actually several of our GRSP alumni. They're going to be joining us from time zones all over the world talking about um, GRSP's lasting impact on their lives and just what they're up to now. So that's going to be a great program. In the spirit of what we've, we've been discussing as you go out and you travel around, you're interacting with folks, make sure you keep wearing your mask. Uh, please keep loving your neighbor, serve others above yourself. Let's get to work.